Uh, good evening, and welcome to the first uh, Aspen Center for Physics, Heinz R. Pagel's free summer lecture. Um, I'm Washington Taylor, Wadi for short, director of the Center for Theoretical Physics at MIT, and I'm going to say a few words to introduce uh, the main speaker in the main event this evening. I've been coming to the Aspen Center now for over 20 years, and I believe firmly that it is possibly one of the best places, if not the best place, to do physics um, in the world. Uh, the center brings together top scientists from around the world to brainstorm on the most difficult and exciting problems in physics and related areas of science and mathematics. Physicists converge here every summer in this remarkable and beautiful environment to di discuss and dissect the recent developments in their fields and to collaborate, producing new ideas and approaches that will drive forward scientific understanding. So I'm honored and delighted to have the opportunity to introduce you to you tonight, Professor Hiroshi Oguri, the current president of the Aspen Center for Physics. Like the Aspen Center, Hiroshi is an extraordinary and unique driving force in modern developments um, in, in theoretical physics. Not only is Professor Oguri a leader in theoretical physics, uh, string theory and particle physics, and has contributed to many important developments in these areas through his research, uh, but he manages to play this leadership role in research while simultaneously playing a very large role in the community uh, through his administration. Of, he's the uh, founding director of the Burke Center at Caltech. He is the uh, president of the center here and plays a role in organizing and convening workshops, conferences around the world, um, and many related endeavors. Professor Oguri is widely <coughs> respected for his research accomplishments and contributions to the scientific endeavor. Among other awards, Professor Oguri has received the Eisenbach Prize for Mathematics and Physics. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's a Simons investigator. And with all that, Professor Oguri still has time to do a great work communicating the wonders of physics to a general audience. Uh, Oguri's popular science books have sold over a quarter of a million books, uh, copies in Japan. And as you will see tonight, he's played a role in efforts through other media to inform the world of the fascinating advances of modern physics. For his work on the film that is the subject of tonight's lecture, Hiroshi Oguri received the Best Educational Production Award from the International Planetarium Society. So I'd ask you to please welcome Hiroshi Oguri. Thank you. Thank you, Wati, for a very kind introduction. Maybe you may want to adjust the volume so that uh, there will not be uh, howling. Uh, so could you switch to the slide, please? Let's see. OK, so uh, whoops, uh, once again. Uh, Welcome to uh, Aspen Center of Physics. Uh, perhaps you can try to remove this somewhere. Uh, so uh, Professor uh, Washington Taylor uh, kindly introduced me, and I very much appreciate his introduction. He is from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, as, you, as he said. And I'm from what they call the other Institute of Technology. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, uh, you know that uh, I have one additional credential to give this talk, because uh, some of you might have seen this TV program called Big Bang Theory. And those are about grad students in my university. So I think that's going to add my additional credential to, uh, to, to this talk. And uh, uh, so let me get started. So there has already been an uh, introduction to Aspen Center for Physics. And uh, this is a place where we come every summer uh, to do research in fundamental physics. And uh, most of us are volunteers. I'm a professor at Caltech, and I'm volunteering my time as a president of Aspen Center of Physics. And uh, as the name suggests, this is a place where we study physics. And physics is an approach to understand the nature by identifying the fundamental laws and then try to build theory and laws from there. And there, are, there have been many applications. Of course, it had impacted our everyday life. For example, the semiconductor technology, uh, internet, and all these came from discovery in physics. But it's also addressed some of the very fundamental questions that many of us are interested in. So in fact, one of the mission of physics is to discover fundamental laws of nature, and then to use them to solve some of its deepest mystery of the universe, such as the origin and its future. So from the ancient times, 
uh, we human beings have been interested in such questions about uh, like uh, how does the universe begin, the how does it work, or what's our place in it. And uh, I believe some of you are here because you are also interested in such questions. And uh, since we have been interested in such questions of, uh, from ancient times, there have been lots of effort uh, to address this question. But it's only like four centuries ago that we have begun to approach this question uh, using scientific method. And one of the uh, pivotal uh, point was the, uh, when uh, almost uh, more, a little bit more than four centuries ago, when Galileo Galilei pointed his telescope to a night sky, and that opened a new window to the universe. And one of the things he realized was that the laws that govern the heaven are the same, are not different from the laws that govern the phenomena on our Earth. Before that, people thought that uh, the uh, skies are made, uh, universe are made of different things, quintessence and other things that obey laws that are different from ours. And his discovery motivated many people, and most importantly, Isaac Newton, to apply his discovery of how the gravitational law works, apply to both how the apple falls from tree and how the moon goes around the earth. So that uh, initiated what we call scientific revolution. And uh, we have made a remarkable success in deciphering the universe using this method for the last 400 years. And we keep seeing these uh, front page articles about new discoveries about fundamental nature, uh, fundamental laws of nature. For example, this happened uh, five years ago uh, when uh, physicists in Europe discovered, uh, with many participation of American physicists, discovered the last key ingredient in uh, so-called standard model of particle physics, which will come later. And in fact, I would, I'm very happy to point out that this front page article the byline was actually in Aspen. Because uh, we actually had a, 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 a journalist, uh, Dennis Overby, who was actually in residence in this center when the, this discovery was made. So he actually wrote the article in this center. And as uh, uh, Professor Taylor pointed out, I have written six popular science books uh, in Japanese. And uh, uh, one of them actually got uh, some science book prize. And uh, uh, so Dr. Uh, Kondo Poros, uh, who is actually a science communicator, he's originally from Greek, uh, Greece, but uh, he got PhD in Japan, and speaks Japanese fluently, and he's one of the science communicators in Science Museum in Tokyo, and he read my book and said he wants to make three-dimensional theater movie uh, based on my book, so can you help me? So I was sort of, so that was crazy idea. How can, so he was proposing like 30 minutes movie, and how can you explain everything like, uh, a microscopic world uh, of atoms and quarks, quantum mechanics, and then history of the universe going back to the beginning of the universe, Big Bang, and then try to explain the superstring theory, which is my subject of research, unifying all these uh, 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 the laws that govern these phenomena. But eventually I was persuaded because I thought it's important for them to do a good job, both in outreaching to public, but also explaining science accurately. So, so this was a team. So, uh, so we had uh, uh, actually. So this is a science guy. Okay. So this is myself. And then, uh, 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 so it turns out that we had a very good service of a horror movie director. Some of you might have seen this movie called uh, Juon or Grudge, uh, made, uh, made by uh, Tadashi Shimizu. And uh, so these are actors, and this person is really remarkable visual image wizard. And uh, actually, one of the actresses is absent. Uh, she had to do some other shooting, but uh, sh uh, you will see her uh, in the movie. Agreement, but thanks to the precision measurement, we now have know the age of universe by three digits. But how do we know that this is true? So what are the evidences that the universe began at this point eight billion years ago? Well, the story began with Albert Einstein. Uh, 102 years ago, Einstein uh, announced the completion of his theory of gravity, uh, so-called uh, general relativity. And this is a theory that made us possible to trace the history of the universe using mathematics and observations. And immediately after he discovered and constructed this theory, 
he was very ambitious and he applied it to the whole universe. And he was trying to find a solution where the universe is everlasting. That is, that it started at infinite past, continue the current stage, and continue on to the infinite future. He tried to find such a solution and failed to do that. Instead, the kind of solution he found about the universe was the universe started out in the Big Bang and started expanding, or it crunches to nothing. So he abandoned those solutions. So he thought that these are nonsense. These are, should not reflect the correct state of the universe. It turns out that that was a mistake. And in fact, uh, 14 years ago, after uh, he abandoned his solution, the, uh, Edwin Hubble, who, uh, who was ob making observation at Mount Wilson. In fact, Mount Wilson is in the city of Pasadena, which is where my university is. From my window, actually, we can see the Mount Wilson Observatory. So when I have a visitor, one of the things I brag about is that that's where the people, the Hubble discovered the universe is expanding. So anyway, so he discovered the universe was expanding, and Einstein quickly realized his mistake. He went to actually Mount Wilson and checked, mm -hmm, that's uh, expanding. But that was a joke, sorry. So, so of course, you cannot really see that the universe is expanding in the naked eye. And uh, in fact, uh, a few years ago, I went to the University of Oxford, and they actually still keep kept the blackboard of one of the lectures of Albert Einstein that he delivered in the same year where he was actually explaining the theory of uh, his, one of his original theory of how the universe was expanding and is expanding. So, so how do we know that the universe uh, is expanding? So this is one of the evidence. <coughs> and, but there are many other evidences. So if the universe were expanding now, then if you trace back the history, then there must have been a time when the universe was small, dense, and hot. And then from that, by using laws of physics, you can calculate many things. One of the things was that you can calculate the ratio of hydrogen and helium. Because initially, the universe was made of a proton and neutrons scattering around. But as the universe cooled down, they start to combine into hydrogen and helium. Theoretical calculations show, show that uh, the, uh, their number was 12 times 1, which actually exactly agreed with the observation. So this was done by George Gamow uh, almost immediately after the World War II. Uh, by the way, I will show some of these graphics here. So those are actually the, the things that you will see in the movie, too. And after, so that was three minutes after the birth of the universe. But then, uh, about half a million <coughs> after, the, after the birth, the universe further cools down. So before that, the universe was made of atomic nuclei, so those can be hydrogen or a helium atom, a helium nuclei, and then there were electrons that were scattering light all over, so you couldn't see through. The universe was more like a fog that you couldn't really see. But after the universe expands and cooled down, they start combining into neutral atoms. And then suddenly, the universe became transparent. And then you can start seeing things. And in fact, the, the light that emitted half a million uh, years after the birth had been detected by uh, Penzias and Wilson uh, in uh, 1964. And they are Nobel Prize for the discovery. So this is a second evidence that universe started out with Big Bang, with very dense and hot uh, plasma. Now let's trace uh, the uh, history of the universe. Then now we are in the stage where universe are made of these neutral atoms. And the universe ex started expanding. And then it started cooling. And then it became dark and thinner and thinner. So that was uh, what uh, was happening around uh, 100 uh, million years after the birth of the universe. And if that was what it was, then we would not have been here. Universe would just forever expand, and that is actually called dark age of the universe. Universe would expand and expand, it becomes darker and colder. It's kind of sad universe. <laughs> Fortunately, it did not happen. The reason it didn't happen, there have been some very profound reason, which I will tell you later. But one of the reasons was that there have been some small cracks uh, in the initial stage, and those start attracting other massive objects. 
and start forming stars and galaxies. And, uh, and then about uh, 100 million uh, years after the birth of the universe, the first star was born. And those things, now we have begun to be able to actually observe uh, by a, a telescope. And, uh, and then uh, after a uh, uh, billion years after, uh, after the birth of the universe, <coughs> these stars start gathering and start forming structure. So by the way, uh, as you see the movie, uh, you will see this in backward. So we will start from the beginning. So we will start from the current stage of the universe and go backward to the Big Bang. And you will see what we call the universal counter. That you will see the you will see exactly what time it is from the birth uh, of the universe. And uh, so galaxies uh, galaxies start forming about a billion years after the birth of the universe. And in fact, uh, as I said, I try to make this movie as scientifically accurate as possible. So one of uh, our fortune was to be able to collaborate with uh, the co what we call industrial uh, project which is a collaboration Check. of Howard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, the other Institute of Technology, and uh, <laughs> many other places, uh, which actually use uh, the state-of-art uh, computer simulation uh, to uh, reproduce the formation of galaxies and stars using fundamental laws of nature. And then one of their mission is to make a visualization of uh, their data. So, so this is just to show accurate picture of the evolution of the universe using this latest uh, uh, computer simulation technology. And then going uh, further uh, along the evolution of the universe, about 9 billion years after the birth of the universe, the sun and earth forms, and that's where we are. The universe, uh, this universe gave us a home of this beautiful planet. Uh, and then we had about 3.5 billion years to evolve from microbe to homo sapiens. And then we even started asking questions. <laughs> How does the universe work? How did it start? So why we are here, etc. But this is, I found it remarkable that uh, it gave us such a long time to be able. The, if you look at the laws of nature, you, it requires quite a bit of work to make this work. So how, why? Why is the universe the way it is? And how, how did it come to existence? That question is still not being answered. But we are trying. So let's go back to the Big Bang. So as I said, so I'm repeating one of the first slides. So three minutes after the birth, the proton and neutron combine to make hydrogen and nuclei. And this theory is now confirmed by the observation of the universe. But then we can go further to the beginning of the universe to see how it was like. And uh, about uh, uh, 0 0.001 second after the birth, uh, protons and neutrons are broken part, part into even smaller constituent. As the universe becomes denser and denser and hotter and hotter, first atom dissolved into nuclei and electron, and now nuclei dissolved into protons and neutrons, and eventually at this time, the, the protons and neutrons dissolve into what is called quarks. So protons and neutrons are, for example, made of these three more fundamental particles called quarks. And in fact, uh, these particles make up what is we call standard model of particle physics. And the remarkable thing is that uh, if we, we use the understanding of the fundamental laws based on the standard model of particle physics, then we can actually explain the stage of the universe up to zero point, I don't even try to read it, uh, there are about, about 10 zeros after zero point. Uh, after the birth, uh, we have, uh, we up to this point, we have actually more or less very accurate and reliable uh, estimate of how the universe was like. But scientists are like kids, and you, if you answer one question to kids, then they keep asking next questions, right? So, so you can ask, uh, well, you keep asking them, the what, was, what was the universe like before that? So, but before you get there, uh, uh, so in the movie, I, uh, it will describe some aspect of standard model. So I wanted to, since you are going to see the movie, I wanted to show you some glimpse of that. So for example, one of the constituents of uh, uh, standard model is called neutrino. 
And uh, in fact, uh, uh, it is now known that there are three types of neutrinos, and as they fly, they change the types. Three, one of the three types of neutrino turned into another type, and it's called the flavor changing. And discovery of neutrino oscillation, the flavor changing, this was actually our wor discovery was awarded the Nobel Prize a uh, couple of years ago. And in the movie, uh, this is exemplary. Uh, this is shown by the particle uh, 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 coming down from the top, changing colors. And then there are uh, also photons. Those are uh, uh, particles which mediate uh, electromagnetic interactions. For example, we have the light here. And these lights are supposed to be actually the collection of all these small photons. And then we have this Higgs particle, uh, whose discovery was a uh, uh, highlight featured in the front page of New York Times, as I showed, with Aspen byline. And uh, so this particle will also appear uh, in the movie. And one of the things this does is to give masses to all elementary particles. OK, so we have this standard model particle with uh, 17 particles in it. So, so you will see this uh, table uh, during the movie. But you can ask, well, how? So we now understand how the universe was like with uh, uh, this many seconds uh, after the beginning of the universe. But how was like the universe like before that? You keep asking. But to answer this question, we need a more fundamental theory that goes beyond the standard model. In fact, uh, there are reasons for us to believe the standard model is not a final theory, and it's not a complete theory. There are aspects of the universe we do not understand. So for example, by now we know the composition of the universe fairly well, or at least we, fairly we know that how much we don't know about the composition of the universe. And in fact, we do not know 96% of the universe. And uh, so it's quite pathetic. We spend 400 years, and we only know 4% of the universe. And this is the 4% that is explained by the standard model of particle physics. And so we still have not much good idea of the, what the rest of the universe is. So it's clearly the standard model is not complete. There must be some law that supersedes uh, that. And uh, one of the uh, theories that has been proposed is called the cosmic inflation. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, this week, uh, one of the two workshops that are going on in Aspen Center of Physics is about inflation and after the inflation. And one of the founder of inflation theory are here. And uh, so this is a picture that you will see uh, representing how uh, the inflation works. It, there was a stage in the universe where there were like 30 zeros after uh, period, uh, and one second after the birth, uh, where the universe had this exponential expansion. So that's the theory. And uh, during that <laughs> stage, the, the force and the matters, even the space and time of the universe were fluctuating by the law of quantum mechanics. In the movie, you will see that uh, sort of demonstration of the law of quantum mechanics. And in fact, uh, if you look closely, uh, in the inflation period, you will see the space and time fluctuating. And uh, so in fact, we have uh, evidence for such quantum fluctuation in early stage of the universe. Uh, that if you look at uh, the light emitted from the beginning of the universe, which were detected by Penzias and Wilson, uh, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, there is a small variation. And this variation can be explained by quantum mechanics. And in fact, these small variations were the ones that are responsible for the formation <coughs> of the structure of the universe. But this is not yet, by itself, is not an evidence for cosmic inflation because there are other theories of the universe that can produce similar patterns. So in order to actually uh, confirm, uh, uh, verify the prediction of uh, inflation, we need uh, some other evidence. And one of the evidence is that uh, there is supposed to be the gravitational wave emitted from the beginning of the universe. And if we can detect them and if we can analyze them, we can check whether inflation predictions realized in the gravitational wave or not. And there have been lots of uh, uh, plan to do that during the next decade. And in fact, the gravitational wave have been detected uh, from other sources. Gravitational wave is a fluctuation of the gravitational field just like lights that we see things. 
uh, the fluctuation of electromagnetic field. The, there's a gravitational field that sort of mediates the gravitational force, and its wave is a gravitational wave. And uh, last year, the gravitational wave was detected by my institute, Calif uh, by a group of my institute, California Institute of Technology, and the other institute in Massachusetts. <laughs> and uh, uh, so this made into the uh, front page uh, article of New York Times. So this was emitted from binary of black holes, but uh, this is sort of proof, uh, uh, proof that uh, we have uh, now technology to detect the gravitational wave. So, so if we can detect the gravitational wave from the beginning of the universe, that would be very exciting. That would be new, new window to look at the beginning of the universe. So to understand this early universe, we need more fundamental theories that unified this macroscopic world of gravity to microscopic world of quantum mechanics. And there is actually only consistent theory that we know of right now, and that is a superstring theory. And that's what one of the uh, things that we are studying uh, uh, during uh, the, uh, this week. We have another workshop uh, focused on theory, uh, actually two other workshops focused on theory of superstring. And superstring theory postulates that fundamental building blocks are not point particle, but some extended object, that strings. That's why it's called string theory. And in fact, Aspen set of physics have played a crucial role in development of uh, this theory. And this is one of the sort of a, 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 a piece that was written by John Schwartz. Uh, John Schwartz and Michael Green was sort of one of the uh, so, so two people who made a, a crucial breakthrough to enable the string theory to apply to standard model of particle physics. And uh, he, re he remembers uh, what happened in 1986. He said cru crucial breakthroughs were made in Aspen Center of Physics. While walking to one of the workshop seminars, John Schwartz remarked to Michael Green that there might be a gauge group for which two contribute contribution cancels. At the end of the seminar, Michael Green said to J uh, John Schwartz, SO32, which was a correct result. Well, you don't have to understand what they're talking about. But, uh, but the, the point was that uh, this was a key discovery that was made at Aspen Center of Physics during the seminars, where a poor guy who was giving seminar contributed in a passive way to the discovery. Uh, since there are some uh, professional physicists here, I want to uh, show that uh, next year I will be hosting uh, the main strings conference in Okinawa in, in, in Japan, and then there are a couple of satellite activities. This was a small advertisement. So anyway, so string theory is defined uh, in uh, some very high dimensional space. Uh, we know that our space has three spatial dimensions and one time, but string theory is initially defined in space with nine dimensions, which means that in order to understand where you are, uh, you have to uh, uh, specify nine numbers rather than just three numbers. And uh, in string theory, it is postulated that these extra six dimensions is small, compact, what is called the Carabial manifold, and it will not be visible to us directly. But standard model of particle physics has a very rich structure. There are 17 types of elementary particles, Higgs boson that will be appear in the movie, and those features are supposed to emerge from Carabial manifold. So we need to understand the structure of this mysterious manifold, and then derive quantitative prediction of physics in three plus one dimensional uh, 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 world from the geometry of this space. <laughs> but we don't even know that mathematics, this is hard mathematics, we don't even know how to measure the distance between two points in Carabiao. So we are struggling to with this question. Fortunately, the power of mathematics is helping us to make progress, and this is uh, one of the things we are doing. So we're, I'm going to show you the movie, and uh, it's, uh, uh, the, the, man fr the title is Man from the Nine Dimension, and it is actually a metaphor. So, so there, are a group of, there is a group of three scientists who is chasing after the man from nine dimension. So this is a metaphor of scientists to struggle to discover the fundamental laws of nature, and that would unify the macroscopic world of gravity with the microscopic world of quantum mechanics. And uh, the scientists' quest to discover it continues. So I hope uh, you will enjoy the movie. And uh, I will take questions from non-physicists after <laughs> the movie. 
And uh, now uh, somebody back there can switch this to, uh, to the uh, Blu-ray. What am I? Why is the universe the way it is? How did it come into existence? The scientists are looking for me. TOE? Yes, it's been confirmed. Find him and we'll have solved all the mysteries of the physical world. All possibilities exist simultaneously. Another dimension! GOE. Who are you? So, uh, <coughs> other laws of nature can be defined, as you said, uh, in many different dimensions. It can be two spatial dimensions, three spatial dimensions, or four dimensions. But one of the very surprising features of string theory is that it requires nine space dimensions, and you cannot do it in any other dimensions. So this is very interesting, because uh, one of the things that uh, we often wonder and uh, think that it might be difficult to answer is that why our world has exactly three dimensions. Namely, that we can tell the location by knowing the three numbers. So, for example, in the city of Aspen, you have two streets closing, and by identifying two streets, you know where you are in the city of Aspen. But sometimes you need to know on which floor your condominium is. <laughs> so you need three data, the two street crossing and the floor number. So that's three dimensions. So our world is made of three dimensions, the depth, width, and height. But why? Why three? Why four? Why, why five? Why not, why not five? And uh, in, the, in all of any other laws of nature, there is no hope of explaining it, because you can define these laws in any dimensions. Three theory is an interesting theory, because it can be defined only in nine spatial dimensions. Well, it's a little bit higher than three. But uh, it is, at least it is actually more than three. So that means that if you can actually find a way of explaining six extra dimensions, then, then there's actually a hope. Okay, so then, then the question is, what is the sixth dimension doing? And what is it good for? And it turns out that uh, this sixth dimension has actually very close relation to the rich structure of the theory of elementary particles. And so it does have a role in understanding our three-dimensional world, too, if string theory is correct, that is. Uh, when we made this movie, uh, I wanted to make sure that there are aspects of the physical laws that are verified and established, and that there are laws that we are still exploring as hypothetical. So in the case of string theory, it is still hypothetical theory. That was why Professor Tabini made, made a point that it's a hypothetical theory still to be verified. And, uh, but it's, a one of, it's, a, it's a most promising theory that, uh, that we are exploring. Yes? Uh, professor, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful window into <laughs> physics. As a physician, I, uh, as I was experiencing the, the concepts, I also uh, appreciated that physics and the way you've presented it can uh, improve our understanding of physiology Oh, okay. Of psychology. Okay. And uh, so I'd just like to propose, uh, as we were all experiencing this, uh, the importance of the breath, the importance of the environment. The temperature in the room is very hot, but uh, <laughs> but it, as you 
stabilized your mind and focused on the material, your time, our time and our sense of motion also changed. Right. So it's very uh, interesting. How do you, how do physicists understand consciousness and then uh, apply human meaning to existence? Well, you ask many questions, and uh, it's hard to answer. Well, I, of course, I answer some of them privately. But indeed, uh, our physicists are getting into this type of research because of uh, 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 trying to understand our world, the world actually we live in. And uh, we have made a big progress, and uh, so we wanted to show some of this. Uh, yes? I've been coming to these lectures for years, and I enjoy them tremendously. When I was working, the 6.30 worked out great. 5.30 became a challenge, so I haven't come for a while. But my question is, in some of these lectures, we talk about neutrino tanks where you find the, the yes. particle. You could, the Higgs, they were able to demonstrate. Are we ever going to be able to prove or quantify a string? Yes. And capture one. Right, yeah, so that's a very uh, interesting question, important question, because, as I said, string theory is still hypothetical theory, and uh, it requires experimental verification. And it is, I have a high hope that uh, 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 verification can take place in the next decade or so. And one of the reasons is that string theory are very much relevant for unification of quantum mechanics and general relativity. And that takes place when the gravitational field is very strong and quantum mechanical effect is very strong too. And one of the areas where that can happen is the beginning, exactly the beginning of the universe. That was why I was focusing on this question. And in fact, uh, but observing precisely the beginning of the universe has been very challenging because as I mentioned in my talk, uh, we were able to see the universe directly only after half a million years after its birth. Before that, the universe was hot and dense, plasma and the light could not travel very straight. So only after half a million years after it burst, the universe become large enough, cold enough, so that the, all the atoms become neutral and the light can propagate. So we cannot see the universe directly. We can infer many things, as I said, that for example, the standard model is buried up to 0 0.001 second uh, uh, after the birth of the universe. But in order to go even further, we need some <coughs> other ways of seeing the universe. Fortunately, we are beginning to get a glimpse of that because we now have technology to detect the gravitational wave. And the gravitational wave penetrates everything because you cannot shield light. So that means that even if your universe were a very hot and dense plasma, <coughs> if you observe it using gravitational wave, you can actually see it. And in fact, in the next decade or so, in both on Earth, and in the universe, there are many satellites, for example, that are going to detect those gravitational waves, or effect of these gravitational waves. And uh, that can give us a glimpse of uh, uh, the beginning of the, uh, even earlier stage of the universe. And in fact, the uh, inflation area, the era that I talked about, is exactly the time when quantum mechanical effect and uh, uh, gravitational effect are both important. As I said, we are already beginning to have observation of effect of primordial quantum fluctuation as a density fluctuation of cosmic microwave background radiation. So, so I'm, I have very high hope that in the next decade or so, we'll have an uh, uh, opportunity to see effect of unification of quantum mechanics and general relativity. And that can lead to test of uh, 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 string set. Uh, some of these, of course, are uh, hypothetical theories are very hard to test. For example, the atomic hypothesis of Democritus, the Demo Demo Democritus took 3,000 years to be verified. I hope string theory will not take that long to be verified. But it uh, depends on how much progress we can make in technology. But that's a really important question. Thank you for asking. Yes, please. I have a question. It's been 40 years since I've taken modern physics, so okay. it's been a while. But what I've, what I've noticed over time is every time a tool is developed to uh, try to prove the next hypothesis, yes. what the tool seems to do is disclose um, some sort of new piece of data which causes the formation of a new hypothesis. And, right. and so physics seems to be, so why, why do we have any more confidence in this one? Because each tool that seems to be developed 
seems to uh, cause us to question the past hypothesis and right. generate new hypotheses. That's a good question. But interestingly, one of the, at least historically, we only, I only know how science have developed up to now. I, don't, I can't foresee how it's going to go in future. But one of the features, at least in physics, not necessarily in other science, but in physics, is that we, make, we constantly make new discoveries and we actually update our laws of nature. But the old law are never abandoned. For example, uh, Newton's law is superseded by Einstein's theory of general relativity, exactly. but we can still use Newton's law. For example, uh, when we launch satellite, we use Newton's law of gravity. When North Korea launched ballistic missile, they still, I, th I think they use the same law. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but in a situation where the gravitational uh, field are strong, like near the black hole or when gravitational waves are emitted, then you have to use Einstein's theory of gravity. But Newton's law is still true in some limit of Einstein's theory. So what we are doing is sort of revision, updating of our understanding of the universe. All the laws are never abandoned, but it's sort of absorbed into the uh, even uh, new laws. And what it means is that the range of applicability becomes even bigger. So in the case of Newton's law, it's applicable to what's happening on Earth and what's happening in our neighbor, like moon. Even if you go near the sun, for example, for the orbit of Mercury, you need to use uh, general relativity to accurately understand the orbit of Mercury. So you see that as you go to, go to outside of the range of the validity, then you start needing new laws. And one of the features of physics, which is actually because physics is one of the most, like physics is the most precise science, is that its range of variety is very well defined. So great thing about physics is that we know exactly how much we know. And we, we know that, that how much we don't know beyond a spot point. So what we are doing by building new hypotheses and by building new experiments and developing technology to test them, is to extend the range of variety. That's what we are doing constantly. So we are seeing the universe up to 0 0.001 second. And we know exactly what is happening until then. And then even if we have new measurement of the universe or new technology, that knowledge will never be superseded. So the great thing about learning physics is that what you learn you get is all correct. And you don't have to forget about it. <laughs> but then, then you, of course, you make new discovery, and the range of your knowledge is expanding. So that's very exciting thing about physics. Yes, please. Uh, what yes. about coupling into the discussion the other 96% of the oh, yes. universe you have no knowledge of? Yes. So that's, uh, so of course, I mean, as I said, we know exactly what we know and exactly what we don't know. And uh, so one of the things that we don't know is that 70% of the universe is what's called dark matter. And more, uh, 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 more than 5, so 25% is called so dark energy. And uh, more than uh, 90, uh, so 25% is what we call dark matter. And dark matter, we don't know. So there are two types of theories. But one is uh, elementary particle whose mass is bigger than any of the particles in standard model. So those would become important when we try to understand the universe beyond the 0.001 second. So they would start showing up. So that's why we don't know the universe after 0.001 second. Because after, before, after that, before that, or should I depend on how you see it, uh, you start needing to understand the property of these particles. So there are aspects of the universe we can understand without knowing what dark matter is. But there are aspects of the universe we cannot infer, we cannot derive without knowing what dark matter. And we physicists understand exactly how much we can say. In, but it is indeed an embarrassing situation. Or depending <laughs> on your point of view, uh, it's both embarrassing and exciting. It's embarrassing because we don't know, but it's exciting because we, we know we don't know, and there are 96% of the universe that we are still to explore. So, so that's very exciting. So it depends on how you view it. Yes, you have a question. Yes. Um, my limited knowledge is that um, string theory at one time was in disfavor. And then now, 
right. to, to doing very well. Yes. So could you talk about those? Yeah, so that's a good story. So string theory was sort of developed in the late 60s, 1960 and uh, early 70s, <laughs> and, uh, but it was disfavored, as you said. And one of the reasons was that string theory was not able to explain one of the very crucial properties of the electron. Electron is, of course, uh, every day in everyday life. You use it all the time to communicate and those. But the electron has a feature that cannot be explained by string theory at that time, in the mid-70s. And uh, around the same time, there were some other more sort of uh, useful theories. So most of the people left the field. Except for John Schwartz, who is my colleague at Caltech, and a couple of other people. And they kept coming to Aspen every summer. We had a program every summer for, uh, uh, in the area of the field. And every summer, they met each other and did their calculation. And then went back home, and they communicated by letters. Those days, there were no emails. If you know what say these letters, some of the millennial people don't know what letters are. And uh, uh, so they communicated, and then they met every summer in Aspen. And then 1984, they made a crucial discovery here at the center during one of the seminars, where uh, they actually found a way to solve the problem. And uh, they, they made a theoretical breakthrough to make it possible to incorporate that property of electron in the theory of the superstructure. And that was a breakthrough. That made it possible to actually derive, find a way to find a way to derive standard model of particles and other property of elementary particles from string theory. So that's when people realize, oh wow, now string theory contains all the property of fundamental particles, plus it even contains <coughs> gravity. So it has a potential to be uni uh, theory which unifies quantum mechanics and general relativity. So that's what happened in Aspen at this time. Yes? Do you ever spend any time thinking about what happened before the Big Bang? What happened before the Big Bang? Okay, so it depends on how you define Big Bang to begin with. So, so it's kind of interesting because uh, uh, in the United States, uh, in, at least among astrophysicists, when Big Bang is a time when the universe was very hot and dense. And then there were periods before that where the universe was actually in a different stage. And in some terminology, Cosmic inflation that I talked about was supposed to be before Big Bang. And, uh, but in some, some people think that Big Bang is equal to the beginning of the universe. So, so if that your definition, by definition, that the beginning and nothing before, that there was nothing before that. There are some other hypotheses or some speculation that the universe actually existed. The universe was actually, in fact, everlasting, that uh, there was earlier stage of the universe and then, then it's contracted and it's expanded again. So those are all rather speculative. And uh, I myself don't spend much time on that because my impression is that uh, our understanding of unification of general relativity and quantum mechanics is still too preliminary to be able to tell in one way or the other, even mathematically, not to speak of experimental testing, or whether such speculation is correct or not. But some theories, it's important that uh, actually most of them realize that uh, there are very various different scientists. Some scientists are very grounded in experimental facts. Some theories are very mathematical, and some are very speculative. And it's important to have sort of diverse uh, 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 perspective on this. And I do not do that, but there are other people who do that, and I respect their research. Yes. Um. So if the universe has nine dimensions, yes. we live in a di nine dimension we're world. We're just limited and we don't, we don't see that. We don't see it. Right. So is there a way that somehow we could see it and that could, and yeah. if we are able, then that would. Um, right. So, so, so we would like to see a situation where this extra six dimension opens up. Mm -hmm. And again, that is what we are sort of uh, excited about going to the beginning of the universe because uh, uh, what happened, what, the reason that we don't see extra six dimensions is that we speculate, uh, at least our scenario, is that these six dimensions are so small, so we cannot sort of resolve that uh, by a naked eye or even our current technology. Just like, for example, when you see a bird on the wire, for example, 
in a, 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 a telephone wire, for example, uh, uh, birds can only go back and forth. Right? But if you have ant going on the wire, the ant starts seeing that where its surface is actually two dimensional. Right? So it depends on your point of view. <laughs> so, uh, so if you can see a situation where you can, you can you have an ability to dissolve this tiny space, then, then you can start seeing this extra situation. So one of the possibilities is that if you go to the beginning of the universe where the uh, energy is very high, temperature is very high, then you start, so for example, what happened at the beginning of the universe was that uh, initially atom is like a point particle, but then they, when the temperature is high, dissolve into electron nucleus. Nucleus is a very even smaller, but then you go to even higher temperature, it dissolves into proton and neutron. And then protons and neutrons are even smaller, but then if you go to even higher temperature, it dissolves into quarks. So our hope is that if we go even higher temperature, even closer to the beginning of the universe, then you start dissolving this extra six dimension, six dimension starts opening up, and then you can see the full nine dimensions. So our hope is that by developing tools, both in mathematics and observation, uh, to explore the beginning of the universe, we start seeing effect intrinsic to string theory, uh, that is the existence of extra six dimension, the extended object called strings and all these, uh, began to be observable if we develop more tools, to, uh, more powerful tools to, to study. So that's what sort of we are struggling to, to do. Any other question? Yes, in the back. So our, I'm struggling, obviously, to comprehend this because I'm not a physicist, but is there a connection between the um, dark matter being the strings and the dark energy being the vibrations and what we're looking for in the sixth dimension is just being able to see where we already are? Right, so, so that's a very uh, interesting question. So, in fact, uh, I think that there are theories that sort of makes, the theory of dark matter, for example, that makes use of ex existence of extra six dimensions. So namely that some particular feature of extra six dimension is responsible for appearing some particular type of dark matter. And uh, so, so, yes, yes, indeed, so therefore, uh, if we, we have not yet, we have a sort of indirect evidence that 25% uh, of the universe is made of not dark matter and 70% dark energy and all these kinds of things. But uh, uh, there are indirect evidence of what these are, but uh, we don't have direct detection. And if we can directly detect these dark matter, say in some of these uh, underground facilities, then we may have a hint of what they are, and we may begin to see what they are, and then maybe uh, if there is a, a feature that can be explained from six dimensions, that would be exciting. So that some of us are thinking about those possibilities. Thank you. Any other question? So I guess uh, it's getting late. People are hungry. So uh, let's call it a day. Uh, if you have any other question, I'd be happy to talk.